Good morning, good afternoon, and good day. Thank you for joining today's webinar on the relevance of FinTech strategy for independent broker-dealer firms, three reasons why IBDs need a FinTech strategy to survive industry disruption. This webinar is brought to you by S2E Consulting. A few housekeeping tips before we begin. If you have any questions, please do submit it in the questions box to the right-hand side. Engage with us on Twitter, uh, hashtag S2E webinar. We will try to uh, end this soon and give you back at least five minutes prior to end of the hour so that you can take a quick break before your next meeting or commitment. A little bit about me, the presenter. My name is Sandhya Krishnamurthy, and I'm the founder and CEO of S2E Consulting. I've spent more than a decade with Fortune 500 financial ser services firms like American Express, Ameriprise Financial, Charles Schwab, and more recently, LPL Financial. I started my career as an analyst and rose through the ranks to become a VP. I have worked in finance, corporate strategy, marketing, practice management, and technology areas. And yes, I do have an MBA from Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. During that, during my uh, corporate career, I've successfully managed projects, programs, and products, and I've grown business segments in the past. Most of these involved partnerships and support from various groups, including sales and compliance and supervision. I have advised CXOs of large organizations, as well as directors and owners of small to mid-sized businesses, since I have worked with financial advisors and continue to provide pro bono consulting to nonprofits. I'm providing all this context, obviously, to introduce myself, but also to assure you that the information that you're about to receive is backed by solid industry experience. In the next 45 to 50 minutes, we will share what we mean by FinTech and FinTech strategy. And we will talk about three reasons why IBD, that is you, need to have a FinTech strategy to survive industry disruption. We will talk about fintech disruptors landscape and look at actions and reactions from incumbents. We are going to go over step-by-step -step process for creating your fintech strategy, and we're also going to include your immediate next steps um, on, on how you could get started. Last but not least, we will cover a few things uh, around um, resources that are available to you. So fintech strategy, our perspective. So what is fintech? Uh, let's talk about the definition. Pascal Bouvier is a general partner at the FinServe um, venture capital firm, around 66 ventures. He's somebody I follow on Twitter and LinkedIn because I like his point of view and his, uh, I believe he's a thought leader. His definitions of fintech in a recent blog resonated with me quite a bit, so with a few modifications, it, is, it has acted as our perspective on fintech strategy. Loosely speaking, fintech relates to the role of technology in the business model of the business financial services uh, institution. But fintech can have various interpretations depending on the extent the business model in itself is influenced by a software business model. So at one end of the spectrum, you have a restricted view, restrictive view or a traditional view where financial services institutions are using software only to refresh their interaction using software. So think of uh, any uh, broker-dealer incumbent right now allowing clients to see their investment holdings as a mobile app or allowing clients or banks allowing clients to deposit their check through, um, through images on mobile phone. That's just, just um, refreshing their interactions but nothing major. In the current view, the financial services institutions are using software not just to refresh their interactions, but also to compete with abstract technology, abstract technology um, uh, disruptors. So, for example, think about Schwab, who's introduced their own version of digital wealth management advice, Schwab Intelligent Portfolios, to compete with robo-advisors like Betterment and Wealthfront. Taking this to the other extreme, there's a radical view where FinTech could be, could be interpreted as every financial services um, organization modeling their business model as a Silicon Valley startup, wherein they leverage um, technology um, across all aspects of their business. 
So it means complete revamping of the business model. So the financial services firm could look more like a Google and less like a Citibank or an American Express. And I believe this radical view is actually no longer radical, uh, just given the proliferation of digital technology in our daily lives. Lending Club is already one such instance. But that would be a giant leap for today's discussion. So for all practical purposes, when we mention FinTech in today's discussion, we are referring to software driving some part of financial institutions' revenue as a standalone uh, revenue generating product. So which FinTech area are we referring to? Uh, are we just talking about robo-advisors? Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to that after our three reasons. These need to have uh, FinTech strategies that we are implying that your organization will need to will need to make a deliberate decision on how it would like to leverage software as a business driver to compete effectively. And this deliberate decision, trying to figure out where you need to be, is the point B for your FinTech organization. And then it also involves identifying a approach along with uh, the levers or big rocks to get to the desired state. We will, of course, uh, revisit this definition because there's a lot more to talk about it. But uh, let's talk about the uh, three reasons why you need to have a FinTech strategy. Of course, that's the title of the webinar. Financial services industry is being disrupted. But most incumbents are not really being proactive in addressing it. Global Center for Digital Business Transformation, DBT Center, is an initiative between Cisco and the International Institute of Management Development, IMD. This July, they released, they released a report on the state of digital disruption and the outlook for industries by surveying almost close to 950 business leaders in 12 industries in 13 countries. Looking at various factors, they assessed that among those 12 industries, Financial services ranked fourth based on its potential to get disrupted. In the survey, the executives acknowledged that disruption threat was real, real and that they believe that 40% of the top 10 will be disrupted or displaced by the uh, digital disruption in the next five years. Not 10, not 15, just in five years. But despite this, 45% of companies do not think digital dis disruption is worthy of board level attention. And 75% do not describe their approach to, to digital disruption as proactive. So if you're not in that 25% who's taking a proactive action, then you need to wake up. Here are our top three reasons. Let do, let's do a countdown. Why do IBDs need a FinTech strategy to survive? Reason number three. To get ready for tomorrow's world. In other words, if you're thinking that you can wait for this storm to settle down, let me tell you it's not expected to settle down for another 15 to 20 years because more changes on top of current developments are expected. And if you do not start your digital evolution right now, you may be far too behind to catch up. Let's look at the digital network evolution to understand this better. Chris Skinner, who chairs Financial Services Club, a well-known network for financial services senior executives, and is also considered an industry thought leader, he gave a, a talk on future of money, trade, and finance at USI events a few weeks ago. During that time, he spoke about four generations of internet or uh, digital network evolution. I will summarize it below. First generation, which was from late 1980s to the beginning of the 21st century, what was, was the first um, generation of web, web 1.0. And, and it was all about getting and providing access to the information on the web. And the information, there was more information being supplied to the web and more access was being provided to um, people who wanted um, to access it. So this was the time for Yahoo's, Netscape, and also the start of e-commerce websites like Amazon and eBay. And web at that point was still being used as a business to consumer medium. The second generation was all about caring and sharing, consumer to consumer or P2P networking. 
with the explosion of social media. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, SlideShare. This was once again many to many, consumer to consumer focused. The third generation where we are in is more about redefining money and exchange of value. Uh, and that's why it's called the value web because it's all about enabling people to exchange value by digital networks. And everybody's on the internet. Uh, it's on the, they are the digital network, um, uh, not the internet, the digital network. And, and I'll come back and say why that correction. And the generation to come, that's after 2020, in about five years, is termed as immersion, where the web acts as an extension of the individual and missions cater to consumers. This particular generation of web is a turning point because of the extension of mobile penetration, which has allowed people who were initially left out of financial system to get included. So we call it mobile financial inclusion. And why this is important is because it's essentially leading to restructuring and reinventing of the financial system for digital distribution of data globally. So three words are key here. One is digital, the second one is data, and the third one is global. The current financial system is designed for physical distribution of paper on localized networks. And this will be undergoing a drastic change since the disruptors were actually designed to operate on the internet, distribute data globally, and are making a mark. Incumbents should not think that just because you know they are able to they, are, they have enabled online application submission that they are designed for digital distribution globally. This is still automation on paper based distribution. And why we need us a fintech strategy is because of what's to come. Internet of Things or IoT will create a lot of intelligent data collection points. And value will be driven by the effective use of data, and hence the, ne hence the name Value Web for this generation. Deloitte's blog last year called Internet of Things in the Financial Services Industry suggested an instance where a personal health monitor is also connected to your investment account. And in, uh, if, if there are any signs of any serious health hazard, like say a heart attack, the investment account would automatically rebalance to limit your downward exposure or transfer your holdings to more liquid securities in anticipation of future cash needs. If you think that's far-fetched, think about the time when somebody would have suggested that your phone will replace your entire entertainment system and you thought that was far-fetched. I guess that was not too long ago. So things are actually changing um, so, and we've got to be ready for it. If you're enabling advisors to act as a single point of contact for all financial needs right now, think about what their role would be if you do not have capabilities to provide them access to relevant real-time data, real data and, and their client needs. That will make them less valuable, less relevant. In turn, they will not find value from you. And this instance is once again not far from reality because far for well, quite a few forward-thinking incumbents, especially banks, Santander, for one, have woken up and have started investing. Uh, and if you're not thinking along those lines, you have to, you need to figure out a strategy right now because digital Darwinism is unkind to those who wait. Things move pretty fast. Why do IBDs need a fintech strategy to survive? Let's get to reason number two. It's to compete effectively in the marketplace. From a broader digital economy, let's bring the conversation closer to home. Let's talk about digital disruptors who are riding this disruption wave and are a direct threat to your market, the so-called robo-advisors. I personally like the term automated investment advice, so I'll try to use that quite a bit. Let's look at what they are doing. This fintech sector scan is from Venture Scanner, a San Francisco-based firm who specializes in researching venture landscape. They have classified fintech firms into 18 categories and have counted 
close to 1,150 companies. Of course, many of them are in the payment and lending area, but you still have about 100 in wealth management space and, and about 60 more if you consider the institutional investment space. To understand if they are really a threat or if they're just too many dots, you need to ask yourself two questions. Number one, are they gaining clients and assets? And number two, do they have sufficient funding to evolve and withstand the burn um, and, and stand the test of time? Let's compare this size. Betterment and Wealth Fund have about um, 2.5 billion each in AUM. Uh, and probably it's come down a little bit due to last week's money movement. Nevertheless, that's in the ballpark. Uh, if you look at personal capital, about 1.5 billion, future advisor, and more than half a billion. I'm sorry, I meant to say 1.5 billion, and future advisor, half a billion. In a 30 trillion retail wealth management industry, trillion with a T, they may not feel significant. But you need to realize that these firms have been around for less than five years. If they have funding or have are confined a strategic partner or two, they can iterate and develop products that can help them evolve further. So do they have enough funding? Seems like it, because um, Venture Scanner indicates that the FinTech uh, disruptors are getting about 20 billion in funding, and CB Insights, which is another uh, research firm, that this one is based in New York, and they research private startups. Um, they indicate that uh, FinTech funding has been growing for more than 46% year on year, and num the number of deals have also increased. In 2013, the funding was roughly 3 billion. It was uh, 13 billion last year, and it's close to 3 billion in just the first quarter of this year. So it, it, it is going to continue to um, increase. Sure, payments and lendings have seen most of the action, but if you look at some of the bigger wealth management, um, uh, uh, disruptors, they are getting back both by VCs as well as corporate VCs. So if you can see, in some cases, you have um, Google um, supporting uh, Robin Hood, and you have several um, financial services VCs like Goldman Sachs supporting um, Motive Investment, investing, and so on. So they are getting plenty of. Uh, uh, funding automated investment advice is mostly ETFs, of course, right now. But that will change in the coming years. If they have the right funding and the client base, they can start building variations and complexity. So are they really a threat? Some of the bigger players seem to think that they're both a threat and opportunity, and hence the flurry of m and and strategic relationships. Let's take a look at them. Initially, we started seeing some incumbents form partnerships. So we have Fidelity and Pershing forming partnerships with um, reward advisors. And then we saw quite a bit of MA activity uh, Fidelity, Northwestern Mutual, uh, Northwestern Mutual, and more recently, um, literally two days ago, BlackRock uh, acquired a future advisor. And then this set of acquisitions, especially FIS, uh, involving FIS and investment show that it's not just financial services incumbents, but also traditional fintech incumbents who are sensing this opportunity to compete effectively by acquiring this disruptor fintech capabilities. As you can see, there's been a lot of M&A activity um, just in August. And last but not least, let's look at some of the incumbents who have announced their own automated advice capability. Um, when Vanguard and uh, Schwab enter into the race, it, it just means that they're looking at this uh, definitely as a big opportunity. And interestingly, new entrants, I'm sure, would um, welcome this because when you have leading incumbents jump into the race, it just means more um, awareness, it brings more awareness around this service. Um, McKenzie estimates that most markets, in most markets, about 20 to 30 percent of mass affluent and affluent consumers uh, are more likely to, you know, they're going to be receptive to virtual advisor model, um, and, and a much higher percentage of this in Northern Europe and parts of Asia where digital usage is more advanced. And more recently, Wells Fargo Affluent Inf Investor Survey saw that 
70, 71% of their affluent 30-year-old responders said that they would use a robo-advisor in five years. 71%, that's quite a bit. Um, so um, automated investment advice is here to stay. It may morph, it may get more sophisticated in the coming days, but it will be here. So let's get to the third one. Why do IBDs? Actually, this is number one, because you're getting closer and closer, and, and, and this, comes, this comes much closer to home. Why do we need a fintech strategy to survive? Because your consumers, your customers, your prospects will expect it. In today's world, with 7.4 billion total population, of which 33% is in urban areas, Mobile penetration is more than internet penetration. Internet penetration is about 43%. Mobile use penetration, 51%. And social media mobile user penetration is 26%. And it's only going to grow from there. So what you will have is a highly mobile, socially, uh, social media active and P2P engaged consumer who expects real-time contextual information and insight. If you think this expectation will not extend to investment advice, think again. Last year, I was working as a product manager, a technology product manager for an IBD and working on a product, an on online advice and information portal, um, and we were providing a new search feature there. And when we went to test the beta version with advisors, advisors asked if the search can behave, behave like Google. They said, will it give a suggestion saying, did you mean when we mistyped something or when it's close to something that we did not say? You know, advisors' own expectation is influenced by what they're experiencing elsewhere. So if this is the case, when they are customers, that's end, end, investors, end, end investors being influenced. And it's not just about millennials, it's about all consumers. This photo you see on the screen was taken um, uh, during 2013 Pope Francis announcement. Um, do you see the extent of mobile use uh, two years ago? Do you think they're all only mo millennials? Um, when we have, and this is the day and age of mobile apps, and mobile apps provide directions or restaurant recommendations based on where you are at that moment, do you think investors would be happy with what we call current personalized recommendations just based on age and risk profile? Or if advisors just send out emails and, and, and call during special days and, and based on the information that they have in their CRM, which is collected once in a year, um, and say that's personalization. Um, we, you know, I, I don't think they'll be happy with that because already they're, they're expressing, consumers are expressing that financial services firms are not doing enough with the data that, that you have on them. As per Edelman's brand share research from earlier this year, 69% of financial services customers felt that financial institutions ask data for their own use. And only 31% felt that it was to provide something tangible in return to consumers. And even as of this morning, I saw a digital banking report where it said that 20% of the top banks in U.S. currently offer a new account back banking process, opening um, process optimized for smart smartphone. Only 20%. And I think was management firms lag behind banks in this one. So in this day and age, where we are in the age of instant app download, will this be sufficient? Consumers will expect contextual insight and real-time convenience. So if you can't provide it, it will really be difficult to attract consumers. So what do you do about this? Uh, how do you go about creating a fintech strategy? Fintech disruptors are agile, innovative, fast to experiment, and in iterate, but incumbents have the advantage of clients, access to funds, potentially client trust, which we'll have to see because of the last few years where the trust has come down, but definitely you have a better understanding of regulation. You can use all this to develop a fintech strategy and com compete effectively. Let's visit the uh, strategy definition, fintech strategy definition again. You figure out where you are today, you figure out where you need to go, 
and you figure out your approach with the levers to get you know from A to B. Point A, which is where you are, should be fairly simple. Point B, well, this will need some work and requires some reassessment. Um, and let me come back to that question about fintech areas. Uh, I was asked this question a few days ago, saying fintech is too broad. Which areas should we pay attention to? When I say we, IBDs, pay attention to. Is it just the robo advisor space? I agree. Fintech, like financial services, is a very broad area. Where you need to focus depends on your current business model. Are you just a distributor? Are you a producer? Depending on that, several fintech areas should be on your radar. In most cases, as an independent uh, broker dealer, your only um, your your advisors are only the intermediary product, and so it may seem like you should be mostly concerned with uh, personal wealth management space, um, fintech space. But if your platform enables advisors to distribute products for holistic financial plans, say insurance banking products, or if you provide some kind of bill pay or banking support, you should definitely be thinking about disruption happening in those areas. I know this is a little um, busy slide, there's a lot of information, but I still didn't want to miss up the opportunity to share something that um, is very relevant. This is from a recent report by World Economic Forum, and they call the report Future of Financial Services. Here, the researchers identified and analyzed the implications of potential scenarios due to innovations and disruption. Um, and this was based on um, interviews with leaders of over 30 incumbent uh, financial institutions and more than 100 innovative uh, new entrants. One of the implications they identified is that automated advisory functions will increase margin pressures, no surprise there, and innovators will gain wider access to mass customers. And when this happens, they predict that the innovators will also compete for customers' traditional saving deposits. And they also predict that more and more institutional investing caliber tools will be easily accessible to um, uh, retail advisors. Further, they said that more insurance provider marketplaces are going to crop up. And when this happens, the role of advisor in the protection area may morph. So as a broker-dealer firm enabling advice, you should be aware that, that these so-called sector lines will blur and morph, and your fintech strategy should keep that in mind and think about how it might evolve. So let's think about how to get to your point B. Let's start with your target market your advisors as well as their clients. Maybe you're also serving representatives reps in banks and credit unions. Think about how their roles, their roles may evolve based on consumer expectations and what they in return will expect from you. Think about your IBD's value proposition in that scenario. How are you going to stay relevant? How are you going to differentiate yourself? What experience will you provide? When a leading multinational bank executive, um, Chris Skinner, uh, asked ask Chris, you know, he asked Chris Skinner, um, I mentioned he's a chairperson for um, Financial Services Club, how to evolve their banking, uh, Chris asked the executive to firstly realize that, you know, in the future, they're not going to see the customer face to face, only deal through screens and make no margin on their loans. And this vision will have to also assume that consumer can get everything he does today for free elsewhere. And he said, based on that, you know, uh, build your business model on how banks can make money. Well, that was about banks, right? But wealth management advice is, is, is going to evolve similarly, especially when it comes to what's available free or, you know, free of cost. A lot of things that our revenue drivers today will be available free of cost elsewhere. Once again, it's not far-fetched. Think about publications, um, uh, you, know, in the, you know, publication industry. Uh, once publication, you know, publications uh, charge for all their material. Now, with everyone becoming publishers, you, me, everybody on LinkedIn, we give away a lot of content for free. So, uh, so that's not definitely far-fetched. 
once again come back and think about the experience you want to deliver. And in this context, think about what products and what what services you'll need to have to uh, deliver this experience. And more importantly, what role fintech or software uh, will will role, will play in delivering this value proposition? Once you figure that out, that's your point B. That will help you decide where what where you need to get your organization in terms of fintech capability. That will in turn um, help you decide on the entire cost structure, both um, you know the, of the organization as well as the revenue stream. When you change this paradigm, because depending on that paradigm, your your hiring decision, your organization structure, everything will morph. Well, let's say you do know uh, you decide and you get your uh, point B. How do you get from there? You know, how do you get from point A to point B? First, determine which fintech enablers uh, you want to focus on. Is it robot advisors? Is it just is it payment? Is it institutional grade online investment advice? Go back to your business model and definitely think about which focus you want to area you want to focus on, and think about how you can develop those fintech capabilities. You have a wide range of options depending on the level of control and involvement you want. At one end of the spectrum, you can build. Um, or enhance that capability in house. So it could be um, innovation programs, incubators, accelerators. Uh, and this is definitely an option if you have some in house capabilities and you're already providing to advisors and you want to extend that to consumers or to other or in other B2B capacity. Or you you could acquire somebody. Um, it's a, a, another fintech firm in, you know, who's Who's looking to um, who's looking for that funding and that uh, access to clients, or you could partner with someone, or um, uh, definitely have your own corporate VC invest in a fintech area. Once again, what you decide uh, will help you um, think about what levers you need to uh, use. So once you decide on the focus area, your levers will emerge. And, and then how you build that capability, it will happen. Like, for example, if you are planning to build it in-house, your levers would be to create a really innovative um, culture and hire the right talent. If you're acquiring, then obviously you'll have to procure, your lever would be to procure funding and so on. So what can you do now? How do you start the transformation? Um, there are a few areas that will require focus and time, um, irrespective of the strategy. So um, let's start with it. Number one, you'll have to start thinking about transforming your organization into a data-driven culture. It's all going to be data-driven from now on because there is going to be an extended digital footprint of the consumer, mobile, social, internet behavior, IoT, and a whole Vast array of environmental data. All this is going to lead to a lot, is going to lead to, lead to lots and lots of data and big data. So you need to start developing um, a data-driven culture to capitalize and develop business intelligence. We talked about existing clients being one of your biggest advantages, but it's an advantage only if you know them well. So use the data you already have on them and get to know them better, and then really have your your um, uh, your uh, organization map out a business intelligent pathway, you know, where you um, use descriptive, how we move from descriptive to diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive analytics use. Secondly, invest in strategic IT. Empower your enterprise architecture group and engage them to um, develop the IT roadmap. Um, that's going to help you get ready for your transformation. And, 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 and definitely they will pay special attention to security and computation accuracy. When trading and investment is highly automated, even small errors in data integrity strategy or execution will lead to large impacts. So security and accuracy will be key. And last but not least, more importantly, include the FinTech strategy discussion in your 2016 planning, if not sooner. If it takes about three to 12 months, to get any change done um, in an organization, but you'll have to start somewhere. Leverage 
this webinar material or contact us if you want other members of the leadership team to get involved, informed about um, uh, you know, the need of a fintech strategy. We'll be happy to do that. But definitely get started. But that's all investment. So how do you make um, you know, create uh, opportunity or wiggle room for this investment by finding cost of efficiency areas. Um, McKenzie found that digital leaders have about 50% boost in net profits over the next five years compared to less digital businesses, but that requires investment, right? So let's talk about, think about ways to create efficiencies and turn capex into opex. Consider cloud computing to reduce spending. Explore opportunities where you can work with vendors to pay for only what you consume. And definitely have proof of concept engagements, uh, or discussions with your vendors so that you, you can decide uh, and try them out before uh, you shell out huge amounts uh, of funding um, and, 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 and uh, decide what you need to receive. Do not wait, however, because you may be too late. Since 2000, 52% of the Fortune 500 have merged or have been acquired, gone bankrupt, or have fallen off the list. Average tenure of S&P 500 has shrunk from 61 years to, that was in 1958, to 25 years in 1980, and to 18 years in uh, 2011, and at this rate, 75% of the current S&P 500 will be replaced by 2027, and that's only 12 years from now. So start your evolution today. And you are not alone. You have a whole host of resources. We talked about some of them today here. There are several resources for you to stay informed, educated, develop the strategy, and execute it. Here are a few. There are a few startup researchers. We talked about TB Insights, Venture Scanner, Technology Researchers, Gartner, Forrester, they're the usual suspects. And of course, you have the usual suspects in strategy consulting and IT consulting firms. And, and definitely with Twitter, do follow uh, thought leaders. I personally follow these team members, and, and there might be more. And there are a whole host of FinTech seminars that might be uh, on conferences close, closer to home. So definitely look at um, using them, and last but not least, consider us as one of your resources. A little bit about us, S2E Consulting stands for Strategy to Execution Consulting Services. We focus clearly on the U.S. financial services industry. We focus on small to mid-sized firms because we know that large firms uh, have dedicated teams or they have budgets to hire big consulting firms. Um, our services are best suited for fintech companies, especially those that are fund funded. Um, Mid-sized financial services incumbents like yourself or service providers to the um, uh, financial services in industry. What sets, sets us apart is that we bring top-notch consulting expertise but with a focus on implementation. Just my own background, as you, as you saw, it, stretches from strategy to execution, having run and managed project, projects and businesses. So um, I understand the key need for execution and that strategy is only as good as execution. We have partnered with several industry leading service providers and together that S2E Consulting and our business partners provide business strategy planning, marketing strategy planning, end-to-end -end program planning, be it product adoption or regulatory change, IT strategy, um, business, you know, analysis, product development, execution planning. Request a free consultation to explore if we are right for you. And if you are not, um, we do not have the right exp expertise, we will definitely provide um, recommendations. Let's recap. Your digital evolution, the broader digital evolution, your competitive landscape, and the, your own consumers and clients changing preferences require that you need to have a fintech strategy, else you will not 